Hello and welcome. Detecting and quantifying nuclear radiation is one of my many hobbies, but one particular type of elusive emission is the beta decay of some radionuclide like tritium, carbon-14, strontium-90, rhenium-187, technetium-99, etc. These radionuclide are usually picked up by a liquid scintillation counter. And I tried before. About three years ago, I dissolved a chunk of a plastic scintillator in toluene, hoping to make my own liquid scintillation counter and failed. So it was time to get serious and invest in reliable equipment. The problem with beta decay is the non-discrete emission and energy distribution of its spectrum. This is due to the weak nuclear force governing quarks flavors inside the nucleus, allowing a neutron to turn into a proton and vice versa. This process leads to a split of particle carrying the excess energy between an electron or positron and anti-neutrino or neutrino. So unlike alpha and gamma spectroscopy, there is no peak to identify a given radionuclide. On the other hand, the thorough mix of detection medium and sample allow for a greater efficiency and better count resolution. This works because the beta radiation from the source has enough energy to excite the scintillation cocktail and the excess is then re-emitted as visible photon of light around 420 nanometers. So browsing eBay again, I found this liquid scintillation counter for cheap. The shipping for such a heavy lead shielded unit was not. I was also lucky enough to find two gallons of this liquid scintillation chemical with high water and ionic tolerance for $75. After many hours repairing this unit, I've got it to work with the software, which only function under Windows XP. The sample must be clear and is mixed with the liquid scintillator at a third dilution. This is then carried to the detector and the counting begins. Two photomultiplier tubes or PMTs are looking at the sample from opposite directions. They are wired in coincidence, which means only photons detected by both PMTs are counted. And that way, interferences and single events can be rolled out. So I wanted to put this unit to good use. And one way to do that is with carbon dating. Carbon dating rely on the somewhat constant ratio of carbon-14 over carbon-12 in everything organic, trees, animals, bacteria, humans. Because of its constant exposure to high energy particle, including neutrons, the upper atmosphere is the source of the carbon-14 we are measuring here. And this reaction happens every second of every day. This has been interfered with when the atmospheric nuclear test of the 50s and 60s injected an artificial amount of neutron in the atmosphere. But in normal circumstances, and as a result, carbon-14 is responsible for about 230 becquerel of activity per kilogram of carbon today. This is about 16 to 22 counts per gram per minute detectable with liquid scintillation. Because the chemistry of carbon-12 or carbon-14 is the same, radiocarbon enters the food chain and is treated by biological processes as normal carbon. And when those processes stop at death, the radiocarbon contained within is no longer regenerated. Because of its half-life of roughly 5,730 years, it is possible to estimate the activity of the radionuclide left upon discovery and therefore its age. Just like any other radioisotope, a time period exceeding 10 times its half-life would yield very little to no information on its age. And 10 times 5,700 is about 50 to 60,000 years. That's why carbon dating is unusable for samples of an estimated age of 50 to 60,000 years or older. But considering the human history and prehistory, this is a very valuable tool for dating archaeological samples, providing they contain carbon in the first place. As this wasn't enough, dating a frozen animal found in ice is one thing. But humans have a tendency to hoard, use, recycle, and reuse material, which makes history and carbon dating more complicated. And this is called the old wood effect. But considering all of this, the process for an accurate dating goes as follows. The candidate sample must be collected observing strict rules to not introduce modern carbon. This includes washing with hydrochloric acid to eliminate carbonate, 
sodium hydroxide for fungi and bacteria, and again hydrochloric acid because sodium hydroxide could contain carbonate in trace amount. Normally, the sample is then burned in oxygen, and the carbon dioxide collected is reacted with lithium metal to produce lithium carbide, which release acetylene when dissolved in water. This gas can then condense into a cycle of benzene in the presence of a catalyst. The benzene is then weighed and mixed with the scintillation cocktail for counting. Since we only care about the isotopic ratio, the amount is irrelevant, as long as it can be detected. Earlier in the video, I mentioned echo loom, accepting high water and ionic samples, so my process is a bit easier. I begin with the same wash for my sample, which is then carbonized the same way you would make charcoal heated in absence of oxygen. A second wash is not a bad idea. Before combustion and oxygen and the carbon dioxide produced, bubbles in a solution of either cesium or lithium hydroxide, they both work well and can be recrystallized as long as the water is free of organic impurities, which is why on the previous video, I checked my water quality down a part per billion level. Link in the description. I used alkali hydroxide for the ability to absorb CO2 and form carbonate that can be dissolved in water and for cesium in DMSO. And then in the scintillation cocktail. As a side note, all of the carbon containing chemical used are from the petroleum industry. And petrol oil is a natural product hundreds of millions of years old. The carbon-14 it may have contained has long since decayed and those chemicals are virtually radiocarbon free. I use these plastic tubes specifically designed for liquid scintillation counting because some glass contain trace amount of potassium and as you know natural potassium has a better emitter radioisotope that interfere with the measurement. Here is a glass vial blank where the potassium beta decay is responsible for almost 200 count per minute. And this may interfere with my carbon dating process. Just like any analytical instrument, I needed a known standard to calibrate my method and validate my results. But the price for the unquenched, exempt standard source for carbon-14 is beyond my affordability. So I made my own. Outside of standards and blanks, I've measured three representative samples, a very old one, a very new one, and this unknown. Just like petrol oil, coal is upwards of 300 million years old and should measure it like a blank. And it does. Depending on the amount of scintillation cocktail and other factors, I get a background between 20 and 40 counts per minute. Here are six replicates of the blank and the number at the top left corner is my carbon-14 source, measured just under 500 becquerel. After preparation, my very modern sample measured about 10 counts above background, or 0.16 becquerels. Since I only used 0.8 grams of carbon, a whole kilogram will have given 208 decay per second, which is what is commonly reported and matches the earlier figure of 230 becquerels for modern carbon. Measuring the coal happened in a different matrix under less favorable conditions. So the background is about 20. And as predicted, coal is barely above that, mainly due to some trace contamination from modern carbon. To test this equipment and my method, I wanted to try dating a sample a few thousand years old. I contacted archaeology department and museums in my area, but none were willing to donate anything. I found this small wood statue of unknown origin. The eBay sailor claimed his father purchased it in the Philippines in the 50s as an already old item. Though I can't imagine this to be over 100 years old. Carbon dating is a destructive method of analysis and I really hate to vandalize this icon, so I did the best I could for science. The extraction and preparation went very well. I set up three blanks with the same matrix as the sample for an even and equal measurement. The sample have to stay in the dark for a few hours to allow static and possible radon to dissipate. And my results are as followed. 
Calculating the age is a straightforward process and plugging in my best numbers, I get to an estimated age of 569 years, which is a very doubtful figure, but this is what I've obtained. And if you have access to an AMS and you can do better, please do so. As explained before, carbon dating has a lower limit, but it also has an upper threshold. As difficult as it is to date very old sample, a few decades and anything younger than about 200 years is just as challenging. Considering the environment and possible interferences, it's very likely I've experienced these limitations. All things considered, this was nonetheless a very successful project. Carbon dating is best performed with AMS. I think I've tested the limits of amateur science several times, and this is no exception. Outside of archaeology dating, carbon-14 can be used by law enforcement to trace the origin of synthetic drugs. The DEA can determine if a substance was manufactured from petroleum-issued chemicals or plants. And naturally, plants would have a higher concentration in carbon-14. Constructive criticism is always welcome. I hope you enjoyed, and maybe I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Damn it!